Hello, my name is Sciencebeard and today I'm helping out Flat Earth. The problem is that Flat Earth proofs are not good enough and I mean this in the nicest possible way. There are various ways in which flat earthers try to prove that the earth is flat, but none of these proofs is very convincing. I think this is in part because they are not presented very well, the thinking behind them is confused, and they embrace too many false premises. Apart from the latter, this shouldn't really impact on the conclusion, so I have naturally decided to see whether I can improve their arguments. Everybody loves an underdog, I'm told. Flat Earth is an old theory, so maybe there's some old science I can use. Maybe there's a competing field of science. Let's call it Science B, which is an alternative to the established Science A. History is full of examples of attempts to explain the nature of reality which have been shown to be wrong. Science A has collected the best attempts and the narrative has been woven from it. Maybe I can establish a Science B corridor which opens the door to squeezing through some ideas which support Flat Earth. Copernicus. Copernicus was an astronomer and mathematician in the 16th century who sought to build on the work of his predecessors. Aristotle, a philosopher from the 4th century before the Common Era, or BCE, had an idea for the movement of planets and stars around the Earth, and that was that the planets and stars were situated in spheres around the Earth. This model had problems. It couldn't account for the retrograde motion of planets, for example, Mars appears to move one way, then another, in effect forwards and then backwards, while other planets went about their ordinary way, forwards from their point of view. An attempt at resolving these problems was to introduce more spheres, but this meant that the order of the planets and the stars no longer agreed with observations of their brightness. Long story short, when Copernicus offered his improvements, particularly the idea that the Earth was going around the Sun, a lot of pieces fell into place, which had hitherto been disorganized and ambiguous. Suddenly everything came together and if you wanted to rearrange one of the pieces of the model which explained the motion of the planets, the whole thing would have come apart. He compared it to a body. If you have two arms and two legs, a head and a torso, you can arrange them in a number of ways. But all other ways, other than the one by which we can recognize a human body, are as indifferent to each other as a random solution. In doing so, he had to get rid of Aristotelian physics as well. Aristotle held that things well, fell to where they belonged. Everything belonged to a different sphere, with the earth at the bottom, the water on top of the earth, air on top of water, and fire on top of that. Everything was made of different ratios of these four elements, which sort of explained why things fell to where they belonged. Okay, so what can we do with this? Turns out, not that much. Trees are made from a small amount of earth, also known as minerals, followed by water and carbon dioxide using light. So trees are mostly made from water and carbon dioxide from the air, so they should float on water, which most do, but also be lighter than soil. We find fossilized trees, however, in the ground. Why did they not rise up through the soil before they turned into stone over a really long time? Maybe we can do something with gravity here, though. The case against water on a spinning globe. So I'm talking about the demonstration of water not sticking to a spinning globe here. And right off the bat you may spot the one thing which makes the demo problematic. Scale. The Earth turns out to be bigger than anything on it. Therefore even Aristotle's theory would have predicted the water return if unhindered to its sphere. What if water always returns to the same level though? Might that not show that there's something to flat Earth? Let's have a think. If water fell to the same distance from any point, if unhindered, that would certainly not be a bad start. If we take the same level to be sea level, then we notice that rivers empty out into the sea. I will ignore the fact that some places have a higher sea level than others. The National Ocean Service also says that some people are surprised to learn this, alongside the information that the Earth's surface is not flat. Nice. So what if water was trapped between two bodies of rock? The rock would want to sink below the water, squeezing the water up. This is somewhat analogous to another problem. If heavy objects fall faster than light ones, then if you connect the, light, the two objects by a taut tether, the light object would pull on the heavy object and prevent it from falling so quickly. On the other hand, the heavy object would also maybe pull on the lighter object, making one hole in heavier object, 
but falls even quicker than just the heavy object alone. And here we have a problem. If the same hypothesis gives you two equally likely outcomes, it is unlikely that the hypothesis is correct, something which the philosopher Karl Popper denounced as unscientific. But we are butting for science B. Do we have an example of this? Well, a huge amount of water has been discovered in the mantle in various crystals, but hey, that isn't free water, so let's ignore that. Is there water underneath the landmass? Yes, there is. And what's more, a really old one, under the Negev desert. Huh. So we have a problem. Aquifers are under the surface of the earth and can stay there for a really long time. But they should have pushed their way up over time, which they don't. I can't see a way back from that, so I'm moving on. Gas pressure next to a vacuum. No, not that sort of vacuum. This sounds promising for science B. If you have a gas next to a vacuum, then the gas will spread out, and so theoretically the gas will be lost from Earth. Let's have a quick Google. Is atmosphere lost to the vacuum of space? The Internet responds in various ways, but most of them give the same answer and in the same form. Gravity holds onto the atmosphere, and as the molecules have different mass, the lighter ones can make it to the edge of the atmosphere and are lost. One reason why scientists don't like florists. Don't ask. But still, doesn't space suck? If you ask a flat earther, they will say, yeah, it sucks, and it isn't real. So let's have a little think. If I exhale with an open mouth, my breath seems warm, because it comes out of my body and I can measure the temperature. If I blow through a narrow hole, it seems colder. Funny, it still comes from the same place, my lungs. And here's where we can conduct a little experiment. What if I force a gas through a tiny nozzle like, let's say, a spray can? The nozzle on it lets the gas expand. The gas, by expanding, pushes other molecules out of the way. In other words, the expanding gas does work. So it expends energy. The gas cools down. The gas particles in the spray can were at room temperature before, not particularly cool, even though I know the spray can can initially feel cooler because metal is efficient at taking away heat energy from your hand. The same effect when you touch a metal object, such as cutlery out of your kitchen drawer. But still, doesn't space suck? If you ask a flat earther, they will say, yeah, it sucks, and it isn't real. So let's have a little think. If I exhale with an open mouth, my breath seems warm, because it comes out of my body, and I can measure the temperature. If I blow through a narrow hole, it seems colder. <sighs> Funny, it still comes from the same place, my lungs. And here's where we can conduct a little experiment. What if I force a gas through a tiny nozzle, like, let's say, a spray can? The nozzle on it lets the gas expand. The gas, by expand expanding, pushes other molecules out of the way. In other words, the expanding gas does work, so it expends energy. The gas cools down. The gas particles in the spray can were at room temperature before. Not particularly cool, even though I know the spray can can initially feel cooler because metal is efficient at taking away heat energy from your hand. The same effect when you touch a metal object such as cutlery out of your kitchen drawer. This, in effect, is the working principle of refrigerators. You compress a gas, let it cool down, let it flow inside the refrigerator, let it expand through a nozzle. The temperature of the gas drops because it has to do work against the rest of the gas on the other side of the nozzle to expand. The pressure drops and heat is absorbed inside the fridge. So what if we let a gas expand into a vacuum? Well, the scientist Jules did just that. Turns out that the temperature of a gas is purely dependent on its internal energy. Pressure can halve and volume double and no change in temperature is observed. So what does that mean? It means that if a gas expands into a vacuum, its temperature doesn't drop, i.e. its average kinetic energy, also known as speed, does not decrease. So that is good news for flat Earth, isn't it? The escape velocity of an object on Earth is about 11,000 meters a second. What is the speed of gas molecules on Earth? Well, around 500 meters per second at room temperature. That is not sufficient. What if a gas molecule absorbed sufficient energy from the sun's radiation? There's a lot of sunlight. So we have to multiply 1 kilogram by 11,000 squared and divide by 2. The kinetic energy would be 60.5 mJ or megajoules or million joules. How much air is there? Well, about 5.15 times 10 to the 18 kilograms. 
three quarters of it lies within the first 11 kilometers. So in fairness, I'm going to use 3.9 times 10 to the 18 kilograms, which is three quarters, but also give all of it escape velocity. So 3.9 times 10 to the 18 times 6.5, 60.5 megajoules is 1.4 times 10 to the 28 joules. By comparison, the net energy input of the sun is around 1400 watts per square meter and half the Earth's surface is 2.55 times 10 to the 8 kilometers squared. This is at a height above the surface. So the energy from the sun hitting the outer atmosphere is around 2.55 times 10 to the 14 square meters times 1400 watts, which is 3.6 times 10 to the 17 watts. Divide that into 1.4 times 10 to the 28 joules, and you could do it in around 3.8 times 10 to the 10 seconds. The atmosphere would be boiled off in around 1,233.15 years. Unfortunately, this requires that there is no re-radiation of heat from the ground and all of the sun's energy is absorbed by the atmosphere, leaving no energy to get to Earth. That's a problem, because we know it does. Also, the atmosphere thins out towards the top end and is so less good at absorbing the heat. The other problem is that the measurable energy on the Earth's surface is often taken as around 1000 watt per square meter. That means that the actual energy directly absorbed by the atmosphere is more like 400 watts per square meter, reducing the amount of energy available considerably. There also would have to be no collisions between gas molecules and no random re-radiation of energy back into space. Hmm. So we can see from this diagram that is not the entire picture. But hopefully this has given you an idea about the numbers and processes involved, but you can still do something with them. There are many caveats here, but one thing it shows is that, the, is that the vacuum of space isn't immediately available to the atmosphere, just from an energetic point of view. The other problem is that vacuums do not suck. Joule's experiment shows that. If vacuums actively accelerated the gas particles through the opening, there should be a net increase in the internal energy of the gas. But this is in direct contradiction to what is observed. Let's ignore that, though. In fact... Let's see if we can't build an infinite energy machine. That would directly contradict the first law of thermodynamics and certainly upset a few physicists. And if vacuums suck, then you would also need a container to prevent the gas from escaping, right? OK, imagine we start out with a box. There are some gas particles in there. We connect the first box to a second box via a small passage, which is blocked off by a closed valve. The second box has been evacuated. It contains very few, if any, particles. Now, when we open the valve separating the two boxes, gas particles will flow from the first into the second box. Let's say that the vacuum sucked the particles out of the first box. There would be a net acceleration of particles from the first into the second box. Now, let's imagine that there is only one particle in the first box. On opening up the valve, the particle should be sucked into the second box. But now the first box is empty, so the particle should be sucked back. With every action, the particle would cross the valve. So let's put in a little turbine that generates a tiny bit of electricity. Free energy! On top of that, since the particle is oscillating about the middle, where the valve is, you could remove the sides of the boxes. You wouldn't even need a container! Oh. This is harder than I thought. Actually, no it isn't, because I knew it would basically be impossible. Ye gods, I just spotted another problem. How hard do vacuums suck? How would you predict how hard they sucked? Essentially, you have another hypothesis with a number of different possible outcomes. Remember Karl Popper's position on that? Anyway, this has been fun, I guess. See you in the next one.